Welcome to Leadership and People. This is a series that pulls back the curtain on leadership by interviewing CEOs, senior executives, and entrepreneurs who've had large exits. We ask these experts about how they built trusted networks to rapidly grow their companies and what advice they wish they knew if they could do it all again. And this is part two of our episode with Jeff Lyman. Figuring out how to sort of remove those obstacles and, and really carving out in some cases particular time of the day where you're not going to have a meeting and you're able to just sort of discipline yourself to say, okay, I've got to solve this like not trivial set of problems that are really going to require some deeper thinking. And those are things that have like shaped your career. If you didn't catch it, uh, please go back, listen to part one, hear about uh, lessons he learned helping build LeBron James, the brand, and uh, and how that's translating over to inventing the future at Vivint. Um, you know, one thing, just picking up where we left off on the last episode, Jeff, um, we were talking about having the humility as leaders to be open to the data, even when we really like our good idea, right? And um, you talked about this, your, uh, I don't know, mantra, your your cliche, whatever you want to call it, that, that you came up with of, if you've got a tumor, pretending you don't have a, well, you, you give it because I'm going to misquote it. T- tell it to me one more time. So, it, it, so when um, when someone has a some type of a boulder in their progression to reaching their their potential with your organization or any other one, either they've got to overcome some interpersonal dynamic or they're not they have some weakness in their sort of skill set. The, these are these are career limiting things, and so in the, the odd thing is. Um, the person who's not progressing because they have this problem, they know it. Like they know it's not moving and they have a hunch about it. Um, but they need, but if you, if you know, you've got a tumor, it's, you know, it's not, it's not productive for anybody, both the person suffering from it and the people around to pretend like you don't have it. And so just, it's actually more relieving to, um, to the employee who's kind of feeling these symptoms of how come I'm, people aren't connecting with what I'm saying or how come my people are frustrated with me or how come I'm not making strides or getting traction on X, Y, or Z. It's like, well, like you got this tumor. And so getting it out is actually more um, productive for the employee. They actually feel better about validating that they know they have this problem. There's a way to work through it than wondering why all these symptoms suck. Yeah. Well, so I want to talk about this for a second. So, um, you know, at Mylan here, we, we've got our, we're, we're trying to be like a Bloomberg, right? We've got our media half doing shows like this with, you know, obviously corporate Alliance is, is the sponsor underwriting this show, making this one happen. And then we've got our, our consulting training arm. Um, and we advise a lot of CEOs, um, and other corporate executives who have a problem with time management. You know, uh, we live in this cult of busyness where like being super tired and being super busy is almost like a badge of honor in society today. Right. And, um, they know that it's not actually going well, but it can really feel like a ball and chain of, I mean, we're all given the same hours per day, but it requires discipline to say no to things. If you're not going to have a absolutely frantic life and we hate saying no to possibilities. Right. Um, Nike is this incredible organization. Vivint is obviously growing in huge ways and, and uh, you guys are kind of inventing the future in a number of ways. Any thoughts on that one where a lot of people know they've got a tumor when it comes to, I am almost like too busy to be effective, but I don't quite know what to do about it. Any, any lessons from your career of, you know, you know, high performance organizations on, on an issue like that one? Yeah, two big themes. One is you get to this point where you actually have to embrace that you're not going to get everything done. And I think when you're younger and hungry and so you know anxious to prove to the organization that you're an asset and not a liability, that you just think you have to get to everything. And um, and then you and then it it sort of hits a point. Um, I can remember working for a manager ten years ago or so who was particularly on top of it. It seemed like I get emails from her at all hours. And she, if I brought anything half-baked to her, I would hear about it and knew it. Um, and, and she was exacting in every way. And I can remember walking out of the office one time at like 8 o'clock at night. She happened to be walking out. And she said, how's it going? And I said, I just don't feel like I'm staying on top of it all. And she looked at me. And this was someone who I 
did and do respect a lot as someone who had it all together. And she said, I haven't felt on top of things in 10 years. And it was, it was kind of an interesting moment for me, which is, oh, well, yeah, you sort of get to this point where you run, you run out of hours. And then what's important is how you're able to kind of manage it. So that was one. Two is, um, you know, hey, there's a growing attention um, epidemic right now. I see it in my, you know, in groups that I'm hiring and, and it's particularly challenging. And, you know, there's this great work um, or a great book written by, I think Campbell's the last name, and it's called Deep Work. Oh. It talks about how it's so easy to get on this, this, this sort of, um, you can get caught up in sort of the thick of thin things. You know, you're, you're, you're racing through email and reacting to that. And you've got these push notifications flying on your phone and people pop in the office and, and you, and you literally don't get into a frame of mind where you do any type of deeper, important, like strategic thinking. And, um, and so figuring out how to sort of remove those obstacles and, and really carving out in some cases, particular times of the day where you're not going to have a meeting, we're going to like put the phone away, um, you know, and you're able to just sort of discipline yourself to say, okay, I've got to solve this like not trivial set of problems that are really going to require some deeper thinking. And those are things that have like shape your career and actually it, it can help sort of shape the company is, is when that thinking happens. And, and, and I'm seeing a labor force that's, that's actually less able to do that than any before. And I think it's in part because of kind of the sort of the digital generation that we operate in. Um, I can remember times, and hopefully my former bosses at Nike aren't listening, where I would book flights from Portland, Oregon to New York and back. And this was the days um, where either Wi-Fi sucked on a plane or you couldn't get it. It was kind of hit and miss. And I would do that simply as a way to just be being able to discipline the thinking. And some of my best strategic work, both on my job, but also my life, has are always done in those environments, um, and which is odd. Um, but I think we've got to figure out a way how to book um, those types of things in our everyday jobs without having to write a huge check to Delta in the process. You know what's interesting, though, is I feel like there's a story in that book from Cal Newport about the guy who had to get that book written that booked a flight to Japan and back and wrote, wrote, the, wrote that whole thing on his flight. Uh, you know, there's those stories of, of uh, J.K. Rowling trying to finish the last Harry Potter's book where she went and rented a hotel room and like hmm. turned the phone off so that people couldn't reach her, right? Um, but there is like this obsession. I mean, people, there's those studies about people feeling anxiety of not having their phone physically on them or not having their 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 phone like turned on and able to receive text messages. What if I, what if I get an important one, you know? And yeah. uh and then when they run tests of like, they have them do it and they check and they're like, they end up admitting, yeah, there was nothing important I would have missed kind of thing. But yeah. it's like, we're not, we're not practiced for it. We're not, you know, I, so big fan of the same book. I've been trying to do that. And, and I find the same thing of like, there's this pull of like, well, what if somebody calls? What if something happens? Right. And it's funny if you like can get past the emotional part of like, yeah, logically, are there really that many emergencies that can't wait till like the top of the hour when I turn my phone on to see if there's been an emergency, you know? Yeah, there's this great book, it's actually um, an oldie, uh, which is called um, Getting Things Done. I think it's David Allen. And mm -hmm. he sort of was, he was ahead of this in the late 90s where he would talk about how like the human brain is, unless you... Um, uh, have a system for parking these things that keep popping back up in your head. Like, Oh, like every day or two, I got to do my taxes or every couple of days. Oh, I forgot. I need to do this. Or in, in when you don't solve them, you like your brain actually as a system just keeps reminding you of them almost like there's a snooze button that keeps coming back every nine minutes. And he says, what happens is if you don't have a system to park that stuff, you know, a memo, a Trello list, like something, um, you actually clog your brain with all of these little snoozed uh, to-dos, and you never are actually able to get any level of kind of depth of work done. And so, um, uh, 
certainly that's really a theme that I think he saw early on. And then now it's like multiplied by an order of magnitude now, um, you know, uh, as far as what we have to sort of peel away in order to get to kind of the core of the real problems and opportunities that may be facing your business or your life or anything else. Yeah. But it, it takes discipline and it takes forethought, right? To, you know, <laughs> make sure everything is forwarded to an assistant who can call you if there is an actual fire, right? Like, to, and, uh, and if you just run things the way that everyone else would like you to run of coming to all their meetings or taking their call when they want you to take their call, right? That's just not going to happen. Yeah, there's, the, there's some interesting trends in tech. You've probably seen the light phone. It's uh, the original one, I think it was in Indiegogo. It was basically, it's a credit card size phone that uses your phone number. It basically just takes calls. And you can decide, I think, if it takes texts or not. And you, you basically put your phone down and you put the light phone in your, in your pocket. So if anybody really needs to get a hold of you or call a couple of times, you're not dis, sort of disconnected from those extreme circumstances where you worry. But you, it, it's a forcing function of, of kind of removing yourself from sort of being in the sort of the, the thick of these thin things that just distract your attention, even in finding out by tri uh, the, the entire process of triaging, whether they're important or not is a gigantic distraction in and of itself. And I've, I sort of look at like, wow, that's tech actually taking a gigantic step back, like literally going back to a, like an, like a Nokia phone that I would have owned in like 1998, but it's, but it's viewed as an enormous step forward. And I think leaders have to, um, they've got to make time to do that because their their teams are looking for them to solve the bigger, harder, more complicated, multifaceted problems, not just bang through a list of emails or Slack, you know, Slack messages. And um, that's one. I think two is, you know, there was a time when I was uh, at Nike and we were you just our organization around wearables and um, and kind of building, you know, this this whole platform around digital fitness, it was a beehive and there were tons of meetings going on. And as an organization, we started, started looking to each other going, we've got to break this cycle and we may need to be pretty overt in doing that rather than just suggest best practices. So we started blocking chunks of the day that were meeting blackouts. I think it was like Thursday mornings or something like that. And like you were expected to be in the office, this was not a time to play hooky, but I think we called it uh, less talk, more rock. And so every Tuesday and Thursday morning, there was less talk, more rock and everyone was there, but it, they weren't being sort of drug into meetings where someone else was sort of controlling their thought pattern or agenda. And that was, I think, particularly useful uh, as a way, I think, from at sort of an organizational level to sort of demand that people... Uh, you know, are making time to be able to sort of prioritize solving some of these deeper problems. Yeah. What, what's another, it, it's interesting, you know, how many, how much many of us would welcome something like that, but don't get around to doing it. Right. So it's interesting to hear a high performance organization like Nike actually did it instead of talking about it, you know, um, what's, what's another one thinking about like what you feel like, um, you learned from 10 years at Nike, you couldn't have learned any other way. Um, that it takes like 30% of the work to get it 80% there. And the last like 70% to get it the last 20, <laughs> or the last 70% of the work to get it right. Nike is such an exacting organization. I mean, we, you would, the brand is more valuable than, you know, trailing three years of revenue. I mean, it's just, it's such a significant asset. And so everything that you would, would communicate in and around that brand, there was no room or sort of tolerance for it to be off or not insightful or weak or not well thought through or, and so there was, you, you, you sort of all felt like you were the steward of this thing, this incredible brand and it's a brand that allows you to create a t-shirt for a dollar 50 and sell it for 29 bucks and and that the the gap in there other than some channels getting paid and, and some wholesale margin is is just 
that, that that brand means something when a person puts that shirt or that hat on. And so you, um, you manage and, and sort of protect and fortify that asset every time you have an impression around it. And it's an opportunity to either weaken the asset or to fortify it. And so, uh, the, the, so my time there in, in learning both through a lot of mistakes and I think great peers and mentors that believed in me, but also would not accept anything less than great, um, creates a culture where you feel like I'm not just the only steward of the brand. I'm here with all, all these other stewards of it. And my job is not just to you know do what it says on the job description or get the whatever the empirical result is, but my job is actually to be a co-steward of this brand with all of my peers. And so we felt like if there was this feeling that if you did something that didn't land, that just had like a really negative social media reaction to it or anything like you 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 actually let down all the other protectors. All, all the other stewards, you, you, if you've ever played football, it was like being a lineman and you let the linebacker through your hole and you should have stopped them and the quarterback got sacked. And it's that feeling when you go back to, <laughs> you, you, you go back to the huddle and like, sorry guys, I, I let them through. I know we lost 14 yards there. And, and that is, that is the sense of kind of brand management um, at Nike. Um, and so, uh, but getting to, getting to great, um, just the, the last, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the time was spent getting the thing, the, the, kind of the last lap. And um, and that, you know, there's a lot of approvals and layers and stuff like that. And sometimes I really had disdain for that. But over time, grew to kind of deeply appreciate that these were all kind of um, brushes in a polishing exercise of getting something ready to go that was um, – commensurate with that brand. So that's, that's probably a big learning. Yeah. So, you know, you think about a trying to instill, like trying to instill that kind of a feeling in an organization where maybe it's not as intense. And, and secondarily, this idea of it sounds like, you know, it sounds like there was no tolerance for over-optimism. Like your, your point about uh, the first, 80% only takes 30% of the time and it takes another 70% to get the last 20% done. Um, when it comes to helping a team like embrace, Hey, let's plan for that. Let's, you know, let's not shoot ourselves in the foot planning to get the last 20% done at the same rate. We got the first 80% done. Um, as you've tried to bring these lessons now to where you're at Vivint, how has that shown up or what, what kind of conversations you're having with people or what kind of, policies or programs do you have to try and help bring that feeling to where you're at? It starts in your hiring. And I've learned this the hard way. Uh, so, um, not, you know, in organizations, not everybody at every level can be an actual equity owner or as, or that that equity is evenly distributed. But what you have to hire for is that everyone can be an equal owner in the mission and the commitment to it. And so um, hiring people in, in that puts a fair amount of scrutiny on the hiring process is to make sure that people are there for the right reasons. Um, so what's and, an example? How do you, how do you separate a good interviewer from, from somebody that you can really believe that? Well, so, I mean, for us, we believe that the home is the epicenter of human life and that if you can um, solve significant problems inside the home and give people time and money and control, you know, and peace of mind back to their life, that, that you actually could make a meaningful difference in their existence. And that, um, and that we could do that not only at a home level, but actually at a neighborhood level. Um, and so... I would spend a lot of time in the hiring process sort of digging into like, you know, um, okay, well, what do you, what do you, what, what's interesting to you about Vivin? And I would do this at Nike a lot because people, there would be people who just wanted to work at Nike because they saw the commercials. They think the shoes are cool. It's like, okay, great. Why do you want to work at Nike? And unless I heard um, a passion to, to actually innovate to serve the athlete, which is not the Kool-Aid 
you know, it's not, it's, or I guess it's way more than just Kool-Aid. It's religion there. Mm. You know, you could easily, when the going would sort of get rough and you would, you would hit sort of hard points in this organization that could be really, really exacting. The only thing that would carry them through was they don't have enough equity to want to stick around. You know, they're, 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 this is sometimes their first or second job or, you know, they're still early in their, early in their career. They didn't have a lot to lose financially by walking away, but I wanted to hire people who had a lot to lose um, emotionally by walking away because the cause mattered to them. And so I think you've got to ask your way through those questions, that person, and then in, in um, sharpen your BS meter and really listen. Okay. Does this person care about the thing that we're trying to do because this isn't going to be easy and there's going to be huge companies that are going to come at us and try and take market share, et cetera. And that, that to me has been, I think, you know, um, the most effective way of sort of building that culture. It's hard to get people to get religion on that after they become an employee. <laughs> it really is. It, um, they either have to kind of have some worldviews and kind of values that align with the company's values and what and what it is that, that the company actually exists to do beyond, you know, uh, give a return to its investors. And uh, th those are usually when you combine that um, those th those values and that alignment with someone who's really capable and brilliant and and can grow and learn, you have the makings of someone who's going to be really successful in your organization and someone who you will not spend a lot of time helping be ingratiated into your organization and get over interpersonal dynamics, et cetera, because I don't care what you wear. I don't care if you have an accent. I don't care, you know, uh, if, if you voted, you know, a certain, a different way than I did or come from a different background. I don't care about any of that. But if somebody aligns to the mission, I'll work with them. And, and I think that is pervasive throughout your whole, whole organization. And that's inspiring to people. And sometimes they need that next, um, that next new hire who's just as inspired and as motivated about the mission as you are. And then that can actually feed an infectious energy throughout an organization. And, and that can be um, a pretty virtuous cycle. You know, it's interesting the way you describe that. It sounds so different than here's the canned interview answers, note what they said, move to the next question. It sounds like when you're asking them, you're, you're not taking the first answer, you're going deeper and you're like, it, it, it's interesting as I think about interviewing, which obviously, you know, giving people a probationary state, actually trying them out is, is going to prove whether our first guess is right or not. But, but as far as first guesses go, that deeper idea of like open-ended, tell me what you're passionate about. And then it sounds like you're asking what's behind that. And then what's behind that. And then what's behind that. Am I putting words in your mouth there? Or what would yeah. You say? And, you, and, and you say things like, Hey, you were just working at this place for the last two or three years. Like, yeah. I'm like, explain to me your best day there. And, um, and, and if the answer you hear is about how the mission of the company moved forward in a, like a critical milestone versus something that is just an individual achievement for that person, those can be really important signals. Um, interviewing is a, it's, it's a, I've learned from doing it the wrong way, especially when I was younger, like how important it is to just get to people's soul <laughs> in the interview process. And it's a really great way. Cause I think some, one of the markers for someone, if they're going to be successful in your organization is how real are they about the things that they suck at? And, and how introspective are, are they? And more, more of like, back to what we started with at this, at, talked about at the start, how aware they are of, of their own tumors. And so I'll say to someone, I'll say, hey, tell me about like um, some interaction you had with either a peer or someone you worked for that did not go well and what you learned from it. And if they respond to that with what a D-bag the person that they were working with was and and how they just had to react to that, you have, that is a really, really great signal. If they respond with, well, you know what, I was really emotional about this thing and I thought we were making the wrong choice. And so I spoke up and really challenged the CEO on it. And, and I was a little bit curt and I don't think it really went over that well. And I, and I should have done that a lot better, but I was just really passionate about 
this thing where I felt like strategically we should have gone in a different direction and I needed to speak up. So that's someone who's admitting that they didn't approach it the right way. But you hear from that, this kind of like passion and drive around caring what your company does and why thinking like an owner versus a renter, which is like, you have to, you, you, um, in, um, you know, you, you have to select for that. You know, if you think about it in sort of evolution terms, you have to select for people who have owner thinking versus renter thinking. And those are the people who I think are going to thrive in your organization. And that starts with the types of questions and answers that they give you in an interview. I love it. I love it. That's great. Well, um, maybe let's close with what's become my, my favorite question lately. Um, what, uh, what piece of advice do you wish you could go back and give yourself 15 years ago? Um, I probably should cross train instead of running the whole time because, um, it, that's a different outcome, but, uh, um, let's see. Um, um, that, and I've, I alluded a little bit to this, but the faster somebody can find, I think every person has a fastball. Everyone has something in their skill set that they actually can spike particularly high at. And the faster that they embrace and accelerate um, and accentuate that as part of what they do and deepen that versus um, trying to be a generalist and being insecure about not being great at everything is to me uh, something that I sort of had to learn through experience. And over time, I sort of started to develop these instincts and I realized that these were instincts that not everyone else was developing. And I started to follow them and speak up on them and execute on them. And, and that started to create a very kind of virtuous loop that helped me understand, wow, there's some things that I, that I think I, I do really well better than others. And there's some things that I just categorically suck at. And I don't care that I suck at them. And that I think I, I wished I would have spent more of my career being so clear headed about that versus being insecure as a young kind of mid twenties feeling like I've got to be great at everything. Um, um, and so that's what I wish I would have told myself. I love it. I think that's great advice. Hey, thanks for making so much time for us here. My pleasure. It's been great to talk to you, Jess. Thanks.